The text this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. These are the words of God. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And as they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem, and when his disciples... James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Gracious God, we thank you for this text. I pray the Holy Spirit would be at work in our midst, teaching and applying it, teaching us and applying it to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As many of you know, uh, at around this time of year, either at the end of the year or at the beginning of the year, it is a, a custom of ours for me to present a state of the church uh, message, and that the state of the church sometimes addresses national issues, sometimes maybe even international ones, sometimes local issues. Uh, this uh, message today is going to be primarily about our local circumstance, our, our local congregations. As you might know by now, the tone coming out of Moscow has gained a little bit of notoriety and has come to be called the Moscow mood. For good or ill, this reputation shows no sign of going away, and because you are likely to be fielding questions about it, or you're likely to continue to be fielding questions about it, I thought it would be good to use the State of the Church message uh, as a way of helping you sort through some of the relevant issues. So we're talking about something that it does not uh, have handles, nice and tidy handles on it, because we're talking about tone and attitude. We're not talking about uh, is it, we're not talking about something objective and concrete, like is it a sin to shoplift this item from the store? That's a concrete, discrete action, and it's easy to categorize. But when you're talking about tone and attitude and motives, it it can be a little bit more challenging. And so let's consider this text. The basic lesson that we should take from the text is this one. Just because it is biblical doesn't make it biblical. Just because it's biblical, that doesn't make it biblical. As I learned from my father, there is always a deeper right than being right. There's always a deeper right than being right. James and John were nicknamed sons of thunder by the Lord. He did that in Mark 3.17. Boanerges, sons of thunder, meaning that they were almost certainly a hot-blooded pair. Also, we can see as a corollary is the Lord didn't let the fact that they were hot-blooded pair stop him from selecting them for training. He, you know, he selected uh, all sorts. He's a tax collector in Matthew. He selected a zealot, uh, some a, a political extremist, and he selected these two men, James and John, and he nicknamed them from the beginning sons of thunder. Now, they were going to Jerusalem, the, the Lord's entourage was going to Jerusalem, and when a Samaritan village denied them lodging, because they were Jews on their way to Jerusalem, the two brothers appealed to the example of Elijah. Do you want us to call down fire the way Elijah called down fire out of heaven? Now, what, what was that story? Well, Elijah has sent a message to King Ahaziah uh, that he was not going to recover from a fall. Uh, King Ahaziah had fallen, and he didn't know if he was going to recover. And he inquired of a, an uh, idolatrous source instead of going to Yahweh. And so Elijah sent a message and said, you're not going to recover. The king responded by sending an armed guard of 50 men to arrest Elijah. And notice, he sent uh, an unarmed prophet. Uh, look what the king thought it would take. <laughs> he, sent, he sent a group of 50 men to arrest Elijah, and it was going to take more than that. Because Elijah called down fire from heaven and consumed them all. That's in 2 Kings 1.10. So the king didn't repent or change his heart or, or mind. The king dispatched a second troop, and the same thing happened again. Just two verses later, 2 Kings 1.12. Uh, the same thing happened to them. Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume you and your 50, and they were destroyed. The third captain was a great deal more polite. The third captain was 
quicker on the up t- uh, uptake than King Ahaziah was. And he came to Elijah and threw himself on Elijah's mercy. Please, you know, I'm just being, I'm just a messenger here. And so Elijah went with him and didn't destroy this third group. The, the third captain saw what had happened to the first two bands, and it was pretty gnarly. And Elijah, basically, Elijah was playing hardball. This is the same Elijah who had summoned fire again on another instance, on another occasion. He'd summoned fire from heaven to consume the sacrificial altar on Mount Carmel. That's in 1 Kings 18.38, which he then followed up after, after he'd called down fire from heaven. The prophets of Baal failed in calling down fire from heaven, and Elijah succeeded. And then Elijah had all the priests of Baal, scores of them, executed. So it's safe to say that the prophet Elijah was no buttercup. He was, he, was, he was playing hard. And James and John did have a biblical example to point to. All right? we, want, we want you, Lord, to give us permission to call down fire from heaven in exactly the same way that Elijah did and destroy these inhospitable Samaritans who won't give lodging to Jews on their way to Jerusalem. But Jesus responded by saying that they had wildly misjudged the two circumstances. They had particularly misjudged the nature of the mission that Christ was on. Christ had come to save, he said, not destroy. And so it's not enough to simply have a verse. It's not enough to have a verse. You have to have a verse that matches the circumstance that's in front of you. If you're you're trying to get into your house, it's late at night, and you... uh, you're not sure which key on the key, key ring it is, it's not enough for you to be standing there uh, and, and arguing with yourself, I should be able to get in because I have a key. Yes, you have a key, but do you have the right one? You have a key, but do you have one that matches the lock? Is your, it, does your key fit this particular lock? Does the passage you're appealing to fit the circumstance that you're in? Elijah was in one circumstance, and the Lord Jesus was in a completely different one. But James and John thought, all I, all I need is a verse. All I need is a passage. There's a biblical precedent. Elijah did this, so why don't we do it too? Lord, you want us to do this too. It's not enough to have a verse. You have to have the right verse. You have to read not only the scriptures, but you have to read the circumstances. You have to read the word, and you have to read the world. You have, to, you have to know what's going on in the world, and you have to know what's going on in the Word, and you have to see that these two things match. These two situations come together. Sometimes we're to show mercy, right? Sometimes we're to execute justice. When? when how? So, this is a knife, and, but this is a, an important qualification I want to make here. This is a knife, this principle that there's a deeper right <coughs> than being right, is a knife that cuts in two directions. If there's always a deeper right than being right, then this has to apply to every kind of quote-unquote right, not just the right that has hard lines and straight edges. There's There's the right that can be categorized as the hard virtues, but there's also right that it can be categorized as soft virtues. There's justice and wrath and judgment. Those are hard virtues. But then there's tenderness. Gentleness, kindness, those are soft virtues. And there's a deeper right than being right in both categories. So it's not just the right that has hard lines and straight edges that can go wrong. This also applies to the right of being kind or being generous or sacrificial or thoughtful. Are there people who are kind in exactly the wrong ways? Yes, there are. Are there people who are generous to a fault and it really does damage? They're generous in a way that, that just wrecks havoc. Yes, there are. Are there people who sacrifice in ways that they ought not? That's true, too. Are there people who are thoughtful and they shouldn't be thoughtful? There's a deeper right than being thoughtful. They ought to be actually thoughtful. They ought to think think farther than their initial impulse of thoughtfulness did. There's a deeper right than being winsome. The problem with being merely winsome is that it's so off-putting. There are people who they make it their whole mission in life to to be winsome for the sake of Christ, and it's obnoxious. It's not winsome at all. So soft virtues can go wrong too. There's a deeper right than being right in that way. C.S. Lewis once commented on a woman who was the sort of woman who lived for others, and you could tell who the others were by their hunted expression. 
And I suspect, I more than suspect, that Lewis was particularly afflicted by this sort of thing himself because he even wrote a poem in the form of an epitaph uh, about it. He wrote a, a mock epitaph that's it's in his uh, volume of poetry. Erected by her sorrowing brothers in memory of Martha Clay, here lies one who lived for others. Now she has peace, and so have they. All God's people said, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> but I meant, well, I meant well. I was trying to help. Yes, but were you? Right? I was trying to help. I meant well. Yeah, but the issue is, did you help? I was trying to admonish. I was trying to rebuke. But did, did it work? Did, was it effective? Did, is it what God wanted? So is it possible? is it possible to bestow all your worldly goods to feed the poor and have no love, to have no charity? Well, Paul talks about that. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 13, 3. If you, if you give away everything you have to the poor, but you don't have love, what good is it? So it's cer certainly possible to do that, and it profits nothing. Was Judas concerned about the poor when Mary anointed the Lord's feet with spikenard? Judas was the treasurer, and he was concerned about the extravagance. That's in John 13, 29. Why wasn't this, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? Yeah, he had... He was certainly saying something that sounded noble. Why don't we help the poor instead of anoint Jesus' feet? And he said that it was for the poor, John 12, 5. But his motives were clearly mixed, as it makes clear in the next verse, because he was the treasurer and he used to help himself to the money box. And remember, in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, it was the white witch who was concerned about conspicuous consumption. What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all these things? So this kind of, uh, in the, for the sake of the poor or for the children, or we have to do something nobler, kinder, gentler, that is often the language of the devil. That, is, that, that kind of buzzkill is not necessarily righteous. Now, there have been eras when the saints were prone to miss the deeper right through a zeal to be hardline. All right? there, there have been eras where... Everybody wanted to be hardline, and then some people wanted to really go to the nth degree in that, and that was really a problem. James and John apparently had that particular problem. Through a zeal to be hardline, hard-edged, they went too far. They overshot. That really does happen. But to assume that this is the error of our age is to waver on the threshold of serious delusion. That is not our temptation at all. Since I'm already quoting Lewis so much, there's one more. When confronted with the flood, we break out the fire extinguishers. We prepare to fight off exactly the opposite problem that we, you know, we, from the one we actually have. We are a temporizing, compromising, accommodating generation. We put up with so much vile gunk that we shouldn't put up with at all. And we put up, we go, and we explain, and we respond. We try to drape tinsel over the message of God's judgment to make it somehow attractive to the world. And we are, we are wimps. We are pacifists where we should be fighting. Now, a fighting generation is going to be tempted to go to extremes. They're going to want to fight too savagely or too, too, too harshly. The, those people have that problem. The people who, who are not prepared to fight at all, their, their, their temptation is the opposite one. Their, their temptation is to compromise, and they say, this is not a hill we're dying on. This is not a hill we're dying on. It turns out, by the time they're ready to fight, we have no hills left. The hills are all gone. Because they, 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 they will always find a reason not to take a stand. Always find a reason not to. And this is because soft virtues can go toxic in just the same way that hard virtues can. We want to be biblically balanced across the board, and we don't want to simply say, we don't want to react to some other character and say, well, he did it wrong, so I'm going to go the opposite way. All of that said, that qualification made, we still have to resist our own temptations, not the temptations of others. Moscow has gained a reputation for taking a stand against the current insanities, the, the wave after wave of insanity. And you might say, well, what do you mean insanity? The, if you're familiar with the concept of the Overton window, the Overton window is the realm of acceptable discourse. And it's been moving steadily left. It's been moving rapidly, 
it's galloping left. It's, it, because if I were to say, I could, if I were um, employed by any number of American corporations, mainline American corporations, I could have my career ruined, I could get fired, I could be frog marched to the, the door and then out to the curb for saying something like, I think marriage should be reserved to one man and one woman, and that's it. And you can have everything, everything disintegrates. Uh, you're down at HR explaining, and then they, they you know, the, the whole deal. You know what cancel culture does. But what was that position that I just articulated? It was the position on marriage that Obama ran for president on. It was the position that Hillary ran for president on. That was just months ago. That was not that long ago. And so the, the, the liberal, hard liberal candidates were articulating the, the position that is now regarded as hate speech. That's how, things, that's how things have shifted. And while things are shifting like that, precipitously shifting, we have evangelical leaders who are saying, it's not time to fight, not time to fight, not time to take a stand, not time to take a stand. We are nowhere close to being the kind of people who would overreact into harshness. If we keep it up, we're, we're, we're going to create a situation where there will be some other people who go that way, but the, that's not our temptation. So, Moscow has developed a reputation for being contra that. We, we don't want to be accommodating. We have tried to take a stand against all of these things. And someone said, why, people might say, why are you guys so extreme? We're not extreme at all. We're simply moderates who didn't move. We're moderates who didn't budge. This is normal, straight up the middle, common sense from 25 years ago. And we're, we're evangelical Christians, we believe the Bible, and we didn't budge when the world said, you must now budge, you must now scoot left. We're, and we said, no, sorry, not gonna do it. And we're going to talk about what's happening while it's happening. Because of that, we have garnered the reputation of being satirical and polemical and belligerent and all of that. And do, don't you guys have anything to do besides fight? Well, yes, we do. And that's what I want to talk about, what true biblical balance looks like. What does true biblical balance look like? So godly satire should come from within a worshiping community of orthodox and faithful Christians, only some of whom are called to it. Ephesians 5.21. We don't believe that every Christian in the body of Christ should learn how to make fun of everybody. We don't believe that God has created us all with different gifts. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about body life in a few moments, but basically we have to understand that not everybody is to do everything. But everybody in the body should be good with every other part of the body doing what it does. So the eyes should be good with the ears hearing, and the ears should be good with the knees bending, and the knees should be good with the liver working, and so on. We, we don't have, you're one part of the body, you don't have to do everything. But you ha if the body is healthy, you have to be good with the healthy functioning of all the other gifts, even if those gifts don't match yours. The satire, the opposition, should arise from the language and categories of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. How does the Bible talk? How does the Bible deal with these things? The book of Amos is entirely a book of satire. Um, Paul has passages of high sarcasm in Corinthians and Galatians. Jesus in Matthew 23, there's little pieces of Pharisee flying in every direction for the whole, for the whole chapter. Wo woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So Jesus just lays into them, and this is scripture, and it should be part of what we're all about. All right, we want to apply, but remember, it's not enough to have a verse. James and John, if they'd had Matthew 23, they could have said, can't we do that? You know, well, they had a, it, you, it's not enough to have the passage. You have to have the passage and the right moment. Those exercising these gifts should have a warm and affectionate relationship with their families. No close member of a satirist's family should flinch when he walks into the room. Colossians 3, 19 and 21. In other words, you don't want someone who's stuck on one speed. Why does he make fun of the Amalekites? Well, because he makes fun of everybody. Right? Why, is he so, why is he so cynical about the deterioration of our public discourse? Well, because he's cynical about his wife's cooking. He's cynical about his son's uh, work in school. He's cynical. If, if he's stuck on one speed, then he doesn't, he, th that's not right. If, 
if the people that are close to this person, the people that he ostensibly loves and who love him, if they uh, start back whenever he looks like he's going to say something, that is the wrong way. The practice, the practice of opposing the wicked, should continue a long and worthy tradition, and there should be broad acquaintance with that literature. There's a lot in Scripture that exhibits how this is to be done, and there's a lot in post-apostolic uh, literature. This, the world is a stupid place, right? M morally stupid place. There have been uh, generation after there's been generation after generation of folly, lunacy. And we're not the first generation to go in for this kind of thing. There's been a lot of it. And God has raised up different figures, different uh, polemicists who have opposed this, prophetic voices who have opposed this. We should know, we should not be trying to reinvent the wheel. We should know what has been done before, what has been said before. There needs to be an instinctive knowledge of the quantitative difference between satire and scurrility. There could be something that's legitimate at certain levels, but if you go too far, you've gone too far. If you kept it, keep it up for another five minutes, you've done too much. There may not seem to be a logical difference, for example, between 37 lashes and 42 lashes, but the scriptures say that there is a difference. Deuteronomy 25, one through, five, one through three. We have to know when to say when. We have to know when to say that's enough. There's also a qualitative difference between the two, between satire and scurrility. This is a matter of timbre and tone, and no mechanical rules can be set down for it, but it's a very important distinction to make, Hebrews 5, 14. This has to do with motives and intention and demeanor. These are weapons, and, and because this is a challenging thing to do, these are weapons that are not to be entrusted to anyone who is too young. 1 Timothy 3, 6. Don't lay hands, Paul says, on a neophyte. Don't, uh, Tyndall translates that as don't lay hands on a young scholar. Don't, don't lay hands on someone who is likely to go off because he's so hot-headed. You want, you want stability and experience and someone who is able to take instruction. The whole point, and this is important, the whole point of this kind of stance is to target lack of proportion, not to exhibit lack of proportion. The whole point is to target lack of proportion, not to exhibit lack of proportion. Matthew 23, 24. What effect is all of this having on those who aspire to fighting Amalekites with a chainsaw? 2 Corinthians 11, 1. These are the James and Johns who want to appeal to the example of someone who is a satirist or who, who attacks evil exuberantly and effectively, and they want to copy it, but they're not they don't have his abilities yet. And then, is the satire coming from within a community that has long experience in letting love cover a multitude of sins? 1 Peter 4 eight. In other words, this sort of thing should arise out of a community where we are practiced in forgiving one another, practiced in extending grace to one another. If we, and, and of course, you understand, I understand, that we are all, we're, fallen, we're sinners, we don't do this perfectly, but you guys really need to be genuinely loving one another, having one another in, in your homes, unloading moving vans uh, for one another, taking care of someone who's uh, laid up in an accident and, and can't provide for his family. That kind of sacrificial laying down your life for other people, that should be the baseline because what you're doing when you're fighting uh, you have to fight because of what you love, not because you need to hate something. Right? So there are some people who uh, Chesterton once said that you need to fight not because you hate what's in front of you, but because you love what's behind you. You love what's behind you. You love what you're defending. And if there are some people who uh, they, they, they fight because they have to, because if you, don't, if you don't hate the wolves, you hate the sheep. And if you love the sheep, then you hate the wolves. There's, this is a binary setup. If, if you don't fight the wolves, then you don't love the sheep. If you don't defend your wife, you don't love your wife. It's, it's that simple. It's not possible in a fallen world like ours to love someone or something without being called upon to defend it. And if you're unwilling to defend it, then what you're doing is confessing your lack of love. 
So if a husband and wife are walking downtown, they've taken in a movie or something, they've gone to dinner, and they're walking back to the car, and three or four thugs surround them and start messing with her hair and grabbed her purse and going through her purse and uh, making vile taunts uh, to her. And if the husband st stands off to the side and says, honey, I want you to understand that I am against this sort of thing. I want you to understand that I do not approve of this at all. In fact, I'm at a fever pitch of indignation. <laughs> Nothing to compare to what it's gonna be when you get home. <laughs> See, if, if a man in that situation who doesn't defend his wife doesn't love her, doesn't matter what he says, doesn't matter how indignant he acts, if you don't defend something or someone when it is under assault, that is not love, right? That's not love. And so, if we know how to love one another and we're experienced in love and we're genuinely loving one another and love covers a multitude of sins, then when the body's attacked, we are, we are going to know how to respond in the right way. And this requires a courageous disposition, not a bullying one. This requires courage and bullies are not courageous. Lawful satire is leveled at targets who know how to defend themselves. Lawful satire is leveled at targets who know how to defend themselves and who will, in fact, defend themselves. As King Loon, since I'm, this is Lewis Day, as King Loon of Archenland put it, never taunt a man save when he is stronger than you, then as you please. If he's stronger than you, never punch down. You're not punching down. You're not attacking the defenseless. You're not attacking the weak. You're attacking the strong who are not leaving the weak and defenseless alone. And if a man is too proud to humble himself, if and when he sins, when he makes the wrong call, or if he overshoots in some way, if he's too proud to deal with that, then he's too proud for this calling. You can't, you, you can't be above confessing your sin when you have, in fact, sinned. Now, sin is not defined by the, the outrage of the target. They're going to accuse you of all kinds of things, uh, even more if you're effective. But if there really is an offense, then a, then a man who's committed that offense has to own it. So, James 5.16, a man should confess when he has sinned. Man's anger does not advance God's righteousness. James 1.20, anger, even when it is righteous, is like manna and goes bad overnight. Uh, Ephesians 4.27. So the man's anger is rotten from the get-go. There's a fleshly anger where you lose your temper. That's road rage kind of stuff. If, you, if someone crosses you or someone just moves into your lane and you find yourself flaring up, that, that anger is man's anger and it's corrupt from the beginning. But even when the anger is righteous, even when the anger is righteous, Paul says in Ephesians 4 there, he says it's a command, it's imperative. Be angry, but do not sin. Be angry, it's a command, be angry. There's certain things going on in our culture right now. If, if it doesn't make you angry to think about them, you're a block of stone or block of wood. There are things being done to kids, or the, the tranny surgeries over the pronoun madness. If that doesn't get you angry, then, then you, you don't have any moral nerve endings at all. But even... Righteous anger, even righteous anger, like manna, goes bad overnight. It goes bad overnight. So Paul says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. The Lord Jesus, when, remember this, this story when, when Jesus was in the synagogue and there was a man with a withered hand there and his, the Lord's enemies were looking at him closely like a hawk to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Are you going to heal on the Sabbath? And, and then we'll get him. And Jesus looked around on them, it says, with anger. Jesus was angry with them. But what was the end result of the Lord's anger? The end result of man's anger is a hole in the sheetrock. The end, res end result of the Lord's anger was a, a withered hand was put right. The end result of the Lord's anger was the temple was cleansed. The Lord did something constructive with his anger. And Paul tells us, since we can't be trusted with anger overnight, to if you're angry and you're not sinning, make sure you do something about it now. And this kind of thing should never proceed from little man syndrome, where a man has something deep inside to prove, usually to his father. Uh, you don't want to be trying to compensate when you're, when you're 
on the battlefield, you shouldn't be trying to compensate. We have to be free, completely and entirely free of envy. James 4, 1 through 6. Envious satire is very brittle and is not very effective. Effective satire is secure. Effective satire is secure. Now, keep in mind, uh, I've been emphasizing there are different personalities, different gifts, different voices. You don't play military music, go to battle music, usually on the piccolo. Um, well, a fife and drum corps, you could, I suppose, but you need the drums. <laughs> uh, there, there are certain people uh, that many people don't realize that Jane Austen, for example, was a, a very powerful satirist. There's two kinds of satire. There's Horatian satire and Juvenalian, not juvenile, but Juvenalian satire, named after a Roman satirist, uh, Juvenal. Um, Horatian satire is done with a, a needle. A Horatian sat uh, satire is very delicate. It's like a surgeon's scalpel. It's very precise. Jane Austen can demolish a character, uh, describe and demolish a character simultaneously. Nobody in the world wants to be Mr. Collins. No, you know, she did such an effective job, but she doesn't wail away. She does, she, it's just very delicate, light, deft touch. That's uh, Horatian satire. And then Juvenalian satire is satire that's conduct, conducted with a canoe paddle. You, you, you just say, you see, you see something awful and you attack it straight up the middle. Both, they can be effective, but neither one is effective if the, the people are suspecting that you're making, you're attacking things because you envy them. You're attacking their immorality because you could, you wish that you could be as immoral as they are. You're attacking them for being that way because you somehow uh, envy them, their looks or their wealth or whatever it is. No, envy of satire is brittle. The target should always be arrogance, not weakness. And as far as possible, reserve all of your errors, arrows for the former, for the arrogance. There has to be a general knowledge of church history, which is going to dislodge the very provincial notion that the current rules of academic etiquette are somehow binding on all generations of the church. Evangelical journalists today <coughs> undertaking to critique a very serious error will say something like, my esteemed colleague from the, co from the University of so-and-so has argued this, and I dissent for the following reasons, where Calvin would have said, these barking dogs are, you know, it's, and we, we don't have any references to barking dogs in our academic journals anymore. But Scripture is the norm, because there are barking dogs in Scripture. There are uh, dogs and uh, people who are dismissed, backhanded, and attacked uh, in Scripture, and Scripture is the norm, not our current traditions. In addition, we must love to sing all the psalms that God has given us. Ephesians 5, 19. Nothing serves like the psalms if the goal is to nurture and restore a vertebrate church. And we must never get stuck on one speed. Ecclesiastes 3, 1, 8. This goes back to uh, James and John in our passage. There's a time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time for wrath, there's a time for mercy. All satire, all the time, would be tolerable for about 45 minutes. We have to learn, as a community, to really hate what is evil. We have to learn to hate. Our, um, the Lord rebuked Ephesus for falling from their first love. It's a sin, it's a grave sin to fall from your first love. But it's also a sin to fall from your first hatred. Uh, you've heard me say this before, and I want to remind you again and again, there is no virtue or vice in a transitive verb. I love fill in the blank. You don't know whether that sentence is righteous or unrighteous. You don't know whether that sentence is going to be good or evil. I love fill in the blank. It could be cookies and cream ice cream. It could be I love my mom. It could be I love the devil. I love the devil in all his ways. Right? It's not until you get to the direct object that you know whether the love is distorted or not. John tells us in 1 John, love not the world or the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Don't love, the preacher said. Don't love, the apostle. Stop loving, the apostle says. Not only that, he says, stop loving with agapao, love, agape love. Don't love the world, the flesh, and the devil with agape love. Don't, don't, don't do that. And 
The fear of the Lord, in Proverbs 8, 14, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. We have to grow in our hatreds. We have to really hate what is evil. We have to really hate what is being done to our nation. We have to really hate what is being done to our young people. We have to really hate the lies that are being told by our culture, by our seers, by our entertainers. By all. We, we don't hate nearly enough. And last, we must all grow in our love for what is good. Titus 2, 14. In other words, hating what is evil and loving what is good are two sides of the same coin. If you don't hate what is evil, if you don't hate what is destroying, then you don't love what you think you want to preserve. So, we have to grow in our love for what is good, motivated by a love that yearns to defend what is noble and right, that yearns to defend what is weak and defenseless, and never to be motivated by a bitterness that seeks to bite and tear. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. In other words, when, we, when we're attacking wolves, we shouldn't be attacking wolves because you want to kill something and a wolf will do. If you're, if you're just out, out for mayhem and you want blood and because of your position, you can only, this is, this is going to have to substitute in. No, what's, if, if that's your motive, then what happens when the wolves go away for a time, then that kind of shepherd is going to turn on the sheep. That kind of shepherd within 10 minutes is going to be fighting with other shepherds because there's a difference between someone who fights because he needs to be fighting and someone whose eyes are open and he understands the need for the fight and he wants to be obedient to scripture and so he rises to the occasion. So all of this is a body life thing. All of it is a body life thing. I've alluded to this several times already. There will be critics around the country who will say something like this. All the qualifications that I just made, right above, all those qualifications are reasonable, and it's good to hear you say that there's a deeper right than being right. We agree with that. We just don't think you are exhibiting the kind of balance that you've just described. We don't think you're doing it. All right, so you're, yeah, you're really good at describing balance on paper, but from what I see coming out of Moscow, I don't think you're doing it. I don't think you're living up to the standard that you've lifted up. And so I would reply with an invitation. And we have replied with this kind of invitation many times. We have replied with this kind of invitation many times. Would you like to come here for, for yourself to one of our events and see what the community is like for yourself? We will pay for the ticket. We will let you speak at NSA or we'll arrange an event and no restrictions on what you say. Would you like to come and see and, and, and just walk around and talk to people? Would you like to come and see? And the answer consistently, overwhelmingly, is no. No. We have, we have judged what we have judged from a distance and we don't want to have anything challenge that supposition that we've made. And so I would, at this point, I would point out and I'd point out somewhat mildly, it would be entirely understated, that not only is there a deeper right than being right, there's also a deeper right than being wrong. And there are people who are just flat wrong and they're not willing to reconsider anything. And, and they say, uh, from the other side of the country, we think that you there in Moscow don't have the kind of balance that you talk about. We don't think you're balanced. And we say, well, that may be, that, that might be. Would you like to come and look? We'll, we'll foot the bill, no because I can't afford politically what would happen to me if I said, you know, God really is doing something wonderful there. There are people who think that, the, there are people who know that that's the case and they can't afford to say it. They can't because it, they would, all sorts of avenues, all sorts of opportunities for them would close up. So there's a deeper right than being right, sure enough, but there's also a deeper right than being wrong. So some people assume that if you move to Moscow, you are committing yourself to making fun of everybody all the time. This is what we do. We don't have psalm sings. We have uh, uh, struggle sessions where we sit in circles and, and vent at each other. No, not a bit of it. We are the body of Christ, and here, as with everything, each part of the body does what it was fashioned to do. So, if the, eye do so the eye doesn't have to do what the ear does. But the eye needs to be committed to the ear and should expect the ear to have a completely different take on things. So the eye is supposed to see, not hear. The eye is supposed to see, not hear. But the eye is also 
supposed to not be embarrassed by what the ear is doing. Right? The eye is supposed to see and not be embarrassed by the rest of the body. You have to understand, and uh, your elbow, my elbow, is completely and totally blind. Can't see a thing. Your feet are blind. Your knees are blind. There's only one part of you, a small fraction of you can see, but that eye sees on behalf of the whole body. The whole body is full of light, as the Lord says. When your eyes are healthy, the whole body is full of light. The eyes see on behalf of the whole body. And if the, if the knees and ankles and elbows said, I don't want to be dependent on, I think that the eye sees things too clearly. It embarrasses me sometimes. And so the rest of the body just wants to bump into things, <laughs> want to bump into things. No, let the eyes see, let the ears hear, let the feet walk. This is a body life kind of thing. The whole body, the whole congregation is the body of Christ. When we say all of Christ for all of life, this is part of what we're talking about. We do not worship a piecemeal Christ. We do not worship a piecemeal Christ. We are not limited to the New Testament. We do not focus on one of the Lord's attributes while neglecting the others. Was the Lord gentle? Yes, he was. Did the Lord receive the children? Yes, he did. Did the Lord scourge the Pharisees? Yes, he did. All right, we want to be like Jesus Christ. We want to imitate him across the board. Someone's going to say, well, when you want to imitate the Lord's um, manner of confronting evil, I, I just want to imitate Jesus. Someone's going to say, yeah, but you're not Jesus, pal. What, what are you trying to imitate him for? You're not Jesus. You can't do it right. What, what should I be doing instead, oh gentle brother of mine? He would say, well, why don't you come down and volunteer at the soup kitchen we've started? Because Jesus set us an example of caring for the poor and downtrodden. And I would say, I'm not Jesus. You want me to love people? I'm not Jesus. You want me to give out free soup? I'm not Jesus. Do I, is, that a, is that a get out of discipleship card that I can play anytime I want? No, the Bible, the, all, of the, all of scripture, it's not just sola scriptura, it's tota et sola scriptura. It's all of scripture and only scripture is our final and ultimate authority. And so we want to submit to all of it and we want to, as best we can, imperfectly, imitate as much of it as can be. So the body of Christ is not supposed to be a bowl of room temperature tapioca where everything is bland and pretty much all the same throughout the bowl. It has to be more like a salad. And when I say salad, I'm talking about an art salad. You know, the kind with bits of bacon and pomegranate and croutons and slices of apple and whatever the ladies in the kitchen put in there. You don't know quite what it all was, but it was, it was delicious. And, I'd, and she'll say, I'll tell you what it was after. <laughs> well, it's delicious. Well, that's the body of Christ is like that. It's a comp and everybody has a different thing to contribute. And everybody in the body is good with what the rest of the body is doing. The bacon is good with the apple. And the croutons are good with the pomegranate. That's, that is how uh, we are to conduct our lives together, making sure that we love God, we love his word, and we love one another. It's, that's how it boils down. Love God, love his word, and love one another. And then let the people who have the different gifts exercise those gifts, and then rally around one another as one part of the body does something that you wouldn't do, and you do something that they wouldn't do. This is how God works. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for the blessing that um, you've poured out on our community. We're very grateful for it, and we don't want to do anything to disrupt it or wreck it or derail it. I pray, Father, that you would help us understand these things. Um, far more profoundly, far more deeply. And Father, as we pray to you, we would lift up the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, After Abraham obeyed the Lord, taking his son Isaac up Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, he saw a ram caught in a thicket. This was God's provision for the sacrifice. Abraham, who knew that the Lord was going to provide such a sacrifice when he headed up the mountain, called that place Jehovah-Jireh, saying, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. That statement from faithful Abraham has proven true time and time again. The faithfulness of the Lord has been seen on many mountains. Eden was a mountain, and there the Lord provided life to our father Adam.
Even after our rebellion, our father provided a sacrifice on that mountain, clothing our first parents with garments of skin. He did the same on Mount Sinai. There the Lord's faithfulness was seen. A sacrificial blood was sprinkled upon the people and the book of the covenant. In David's day, the Lord's provision was seen on Mount Jerusalem, as God swore an oath to give David a son who would rule. And that son, Solomon, came forth on that mountain. And it was on that same mountain that our Lord himself gave his life and instituted this supper in which he says, This is my body broken for you. This table reduces all of our sin to a singular point. That point is our doubt that on the mount of the Lord, his provision shall be seen. Our anxieties, complaining, covetousness, sour attitude, biting and devouring, you name it, all of it boils down to our disbelief in what is richly displayed before us now. We must learn to see every sin for what it is, an attempt to strip the Lord of his rightful name, Jehovah Jireh. Likewise, we must look to whatever difficult terrain faces us in the coming year and say with Abraham, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And we here today have come to that heavenly Mount Zion. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you for your continual provision through your Son. We ask that you strengthen our faith as we come to this table, for we come in Jesus' name. And amen. The challenge of our culture around us, this is the charge, the challenge of our culture around us and the forces that are arrayed against us make us want to think that we must think cosmically or in grand, on a grand scale. But as P.J. O'Rourke once put it, everyone wants to save the world, but no one wants to help mom with the dishes. Every, uh, in, or peanuts, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. And, and the thing to do, you say, what do I do? How do, we, how do we engage? How do we truly engage? You love one another. You love one another. That's the seedbed out of which all the various plants that God wants to have grow will grow. Love one another. And that, that has to translate into practical things. Love when, when someone is laid up, cook meals for them, helping unload moving vans, uh, taking, taking over someone's position at work when they, when they can't be there. This, you know, tangible expressions of love. That kind of healthy community is the kind of community that you can entrust with this other sort of stuff. And with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.